Hi everyone, I'm Chloe. Welcome to the Money Buddies podcast and today I'm so excited to have Grant on the podcast who is, if you guys don't know, which is probably unlikely, the probability is low. He is the creator behind the Mathematics YouTube channel 3 Blue 1 Brown. So thank you Grant so much for coming on. Oh, thanks for having me on. No, I'm so excited. So I want to get a bit started. So obviously you're like amazing, so well known in the mathematics space. But were you always interested in mathematics when you were younger? Um, I was one of those kids who was. uh, Yeah, I think from a very young age, I remember certain games my dad would play with me that related to math. And I liked puzzles and numbers and that kind of thing. Um, Not everyone who is into math has that as the history of like always loving it. There's plenty of people I know who really hated it for a long time, even up through college. But for whatever reason, you know, through programming or through a desire to understand physics or just having seen it the right way, they came to it later. Um, Yeah, I'm one of those nerds that (laughs) was kind of through and through from the start. Was was that kind of like a natural progression to your interest in like computer science as well and coding? Uh, I mean, I came late to that in the grand scheme of things. I mean, I didn't start properly learning until like college or so um, because, you know, I, I didn't have a high school that, you know, taught programming or anything like that. And um, maybe like one or two kids around me in high school might have um, been savvy with, with computers in that way, but uh, they're, they're, they play to the same parts of the brain. So I think a lot of the problem solving love that had um, been a part of my life through high school uh, just naturally works its way into enjoying programming once you sink your teeth into it. So you said you and your dad would, you remember playing lots of like games of him when you're younger related to math. Would you say that played like a big role in like your interest in now pursuing that as an adult? I mean, it's always hard to attribute cause to these things. Uh, it's he, in many different respects, both my parents were very engaged. Um, and so I think he, you know, he, he had a desire that both my brother and me like really enjoy learning and uh, math or other sciences were going to be a part of that. So there were certain counting puzzles that I always like talk about or think of if I'm trying to look back to what's the earliest memory I have enjoying math. But there's good teachers along the way too, where just a couple of pivotal, uh, pivotal cases along the way. Um, there's one particular high school calculus teacher I had who took an effort to like tell me about the things that math could be outside of the very linear trajectory that you see in a um, in a school setting. That probably made a difference. I mean, he t- told me about this thing called math circles, uh, which was run at like a university, University of Utah, loosely near where I lived. And I think going to that was the first time I ever like saw or heard of the premise of a mathematician being a thing, which previously was not in my mind as as a valid you know, career trajectory in any way. Um, And so I knew I would major in math when I went to college, but as far as like knowing that I would try to carve a career that was somehow uh, uh, oriented around it. um, I mean, I think that took a lot longer, even when I was leaving college, it it wasn't entirely clear. I think in my own mind, what the plan would be. Um, There was kind of a pull towards software engineering, which is a natural thing if you live in the Bay area and if you love programming. Right. Um, But I I took some time to like teach at Khan Academy um, and three blue and brown was like small, but happening on the side. And I had a vague sense that I really enjoy outreach and like somehow carving a career around that could be nice. And the probable way to do that would have been, you know, do a PhD, become a professor, become one of those who's like by day, just a normal mathematician, but enjoys uh, engaging in the outreach side of that, um, which, and there's plenty of people who fit that mold. Uh, but as three blue and brown was growing um, and, and, you know, through the Khan Academy stuff and, things of that sort, it maybe became clear that there was another path potentially available that was slightly more entrepreneurial in nature, uh, just running with the momentum of what existed in that moment, rather than kind of sticking to the original guns of like, okay, how have I seen it done before? Should I walk down that exact same path? So I'm curious and going back a few steps. So how did you get involved in like Khan Academy and more the education part of mathematics and um, I mean, I enjoyed tutoring uh, since, you know, younger. I think I was probably really bad at tutoring when I was in high school, but I probably, I like to think I got better at it uh, over time. And um, it, in Stanford, the, there would be opportunities to sometimes give uh, seminars or talks, uh, whether that was to like visiting high school students or just in like small friend groups to one another. Um, and so as I was nearing the end of college and leaving, I loosely started just putting some things online with the thought of, hey, it can't hurt to have some kind of online footprint. And there's certain ideas that seem like they fit as like a you know, short video lecture. And it happened to be the case that at that same time, Khan Academy um, was doing this thing they called the talent search, where they were just starting to think about extending their content team outside of just Sal on his own making yeah. all the videos. 
I, when, I mean, there'd been a content team making exercises and things like that for a while, but like other video creators, um, they hadn't really extended beyond. Um, and so they were doing these fellowships. Uh, I ended up like applying, being one of them. Oh, sorry, those were two distinct things. They had like a content fellowship and they had a talent search and like the two were like loosely in line with each other. But the like long, long story short of it is I ended up as one of their like content fellows among uh, maybe uh, like eight others or so. And um, it was like this one year program uh, that was you know, like they choose experts in certain fields and they would like make videos about it. And, uh, you know, it was uh, it was actually a great time, um, but I won't I won't jabber too much at length about all that. So during that time, you're also kind of slowly building 3.1 Brown. So how did you like that? Because when you were doing it, it was pretty new, the idea of like animation, making maths more engaging. So how did you, okay, back a few steps. How did you even create the Manum library? Can you tell us about that? Sure. Well, I mean, the project actually started with that more than YouTube, where like I've alluded to so far, I really enjoyed programming. Um, around the time I was starting this, I'd been taking a lot more math and like thinking of math as being the, the general path. And just was itching for like a personal programming project. And I thought it might be fun to put together just like a, a, a sort of a scrappy tool for myself to be able to put together. Um, I think the original thought was visuals that were oriented around displaying functions, not as graphs, but as like other ways that you could visualize functions in particular as a transformation. Um, and I remember there was a clicking moment when I was taking complex analysis uh, where it was, you know, you, you kind of run into this wall with complex analysis where Real analysis, you can think of real functions with graphs and gain a lot of intuition from that. Same with just calculus with real numbers. And in complex uh, numbers, you just sort of throw that out the window. You're like complex functions, you're not gonna be able to graph them. Or if you can, the graphs like don't really give you as much intuition as you want them to, because you say, you know, your input plane and then the output, you're just looking at, you know, the magnitude of the output or the argument or, or just the real component or the imaginary component. And like all the facts from complex analysis didn't really pop out with that as a visualization but like very simply if you just stay in two dimensions and you kind of think of moving all the inputs over to the outputs there's just so many things that became a lot clearer um from just the like basic premises in that class and i kind of thought okay if we um there's lots of other situations where shifting the way that you visualize a function can be helpful but there's not graphing software for it um in the way that like desmos exists and you can just go and like play around with it uh so like loosely scrambling together something for my own sake also with the thought in mind that it's just fun to have a personal coding project like if the ambition was to use a software tool to make a youtube channel i would have used something that was much better established and had like plugins that i could adapt as i wanted rather than just a ground up thing um that was the original thought and i used it to make one little lecture it wasn't i, I originally intended for it to be more about complex analysis but it, it ended up not being as much but that was like kind of in the back of my mind while making it and then from that point on, there was kind of this interrelationship between as I would make another video, I would make the tool a little better. It's always been scrappy, but just like piece by piece, it might be a little better for my needs. And then as I would make it a little better, a different video might come to mind. Um, so those yeah, are always kind of married. People are using it to create their own math explainers and everything. So yeah, which I, sh I should say is largely due like to this community that emerged that basically they, they recognized that I wasn't very responsive to um making it user-friendly in terms of documentation and like testing that. And they just like took it and adapted it. And since then, like uh, created a fork that is like pretty different, but like very oriented around being like by the community for the community. And it's such a nice illustration of how the internet just runs with things, even when you're not like all that on top of it. Oh yeah, that's amazing. That's so cool. Like, so you were discussing before actually how you could have taken the route of like, you know, PhD, but you decided this YouTube route. So obviously now you've created a great community. I think many would argue that you've like really influenced mathematics and education even more so than you would have maybe had reach if you were just in like that usual education setting. So I was going to discuss just like, you know, your influence on education, particularly your work, like, for example, the Summer of Math Exposition and how you really want to encourage others to create math explainers and share their knowledge. Um, yeah, I mean, that project in particular, yeah, sort of a broad question, but I'll index on that last part where um, the, it, it started off where I wanted, um, just for unrelated reasons, to have a little internship program to, uh, like, uh, adapt some of the content to a different format. And when um, uh, someone I was working with and me at the time were going through all the intern applications, 
uh, people were like talking about all these things they were excited to maybe make for the summer. They were unrelated to what I was looking to hire for, but it was just clearly this pile of people who were interested in making things in the space of math exposition. Um, and we were kind of thinking like, man, it, it feels a little bit sad to just like say no to most of them. And like, hopefully they make their project, but like doing nothing to support that. And I thought like, if we just do the, the tiniest thing that we can of holding up some notion of, hey, do the thing you want to anyway, don't necessarily frame it in the context of like internship doesn't even have to be for that age range, just anyone, if you're a teacher, if you're younger, whatever have you, um, if you have this idea for something you want to explain, like there's so much value to putting it online where it exists forever. And um, to having a forcing function where you actually end up following through because there's a deadline, rather than kind of thinking in the back of your mind, oh, wouldn't it be fun to one day like make such and such. Um, so we just basically just put up a deadline. Um, Brilliant came in and offered some cash prizes, which was nice. Not even necessary, maybe in terms of like getting people to do it, but maybe, maybe that like pushed the needle on people trying a little bit harder. Um, it was it was really inspiring to see everything that people submitted. It the worst part good. of that project it's by far. Nice. Yeah, it was um, choosing winners because I'm like, well, this is an absurd premise. There's so many really good ones. And like I arbitrarily said I'd choose five and like it's so subjective by the time you're like down to the top 50. Um, and one of the things that was really inspiring, actually, is before I did anything to announce winners or like post on my channel, hey, here's some people that you should check out. Look at this playlist. Uh, they had gotten a lot of traction on YouTube already. Just the fact that you have this cohort of people who are all like making something at the same time and looking at each other's, like the fact that we did a, a peer review process to help filter things down in that final stage meant that there was a necessity to have at least a couple of people look at the thing that you made. And it was a couple of people who were like-minded and they're like sharing it on the Discord. Um, and I sort of realized like all of this activity, the, the value is coming not at all from my own publicizing it or like telling people to go to it. I hope that, you know, got some more people's attention, but you just tell people to do something and, and coordinate it in the smallest possible way. And again, like the internet kind of surprises you. So we'll, we'll do that again in some capacity. And I'm looking forward to refining it because there's a lot that we should have like maybe fixed about the process. Um, but I, there's just such like such a large pile of potential energy of people like you who you know want to make things have something to say uh can put it out in a way that just exists in perpetuity there to like help or inspire someone that happens to stumble across it forever and that's very powerful and especially with home learning it's so good for people to share all this knowledge online because you know sometimes in class it's a bit different but i wanted to actually discuss this is a bit off topic but like your math explainers are actually so beautiful like and obviously all the people they, like genuinely I was one day in science class and I was just watching it like I didn't even have the sound on like I was just re-watching a video I watched again because the animation is so beautiful like genuinely so you're like engaging people through that a lot and obviously now like your reddit you said your discord so many people are on it you see people really actively uploading math explainer videos onto it and sharing that through the community so you've really facilitated this growth of like smaller creators you know sharing their math knowledge which is really really amazing i think that's so cool i i mean i'm touched to hear you say that uh who it's potentially best for is the people making the videos sometimes like often the greatest way to learn something is to try to explain it yourself it's great if that can be social and you're getting um closed loop feedback from the person you're trying to teach but even the act of simply putting together the explanation in a vacuum really refines your own relationship with it um and i, I would encourage anyone to give it a shot if they loosely thought about it i mean it takes time but different styles can take less time um simply for the fact that you you understand something at a much deeper level than you otherwise would have. Uh, and I, I think anyone who participated in the Summer of Math Exposition would probably agree with that. That's so cool. I'm just, guys, I'm just here. Yeah, I'm so excited. I'm a big fan of Grant. This is so cool. Um, so I wanted to discuss also more on um, now, like your future goals for 3 boy one brown or like for yourself in terms of the mathematics realm. Sure. Um, I mean, so I, I felt a little bit guilty about not making more things. Uh, you know, I, like the pace felt like it sort of slowed down for reasons that were hard to put my finger on. Um, so as I was like planning out, you know, just videos for 2022, I just wanted to think a little bit more critically on like what parts of the process were taking long and why. Uh, and I think one of my goals is to, like I still want to keep a, a high standard in terms of what the actual explanation is and if there's visuals that really help with it. Um, like pour the time that's necessary into that. But being a lot more casual about the 
the actual vibe of the video, like trying not to overproduce it in the sense of um, sounding like it's very scripted and all of that. And, you know, one of my personal goals is that even if there's aspects of it that have like higher production quality, try to make it feel just to the viewer, like it's you and me in a room, just looking at the same thing together um, and like make it feel casual in that way. Uh, you know, another goal is to just be a little bit more principled on, um, it sounds silly, but like explaining the things that people want to know the answers to, uh, where th there's lots of ha happy rabbit holes that I can get sidetracked into because I'm just really interested in something and dive people into it. And there's a place for that. When you talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe, yeah, but I'll, I'll give you an example. There's like, um, I think I, I originally conceived of the channel as being all the topics that you'd never see in school because it doesn't usually come up in a typical trajectory. And it's all those little hidden corners of math, right? And there's a place for that. But some of the videos that I've gotten the most gratitude for are the ones where it's absolutely a topic you come across in school, like a series about calculus or about linear algebra calculus, or like what so are Fourier good. transforms. So good. Um, <laughs> but my, my point is that those uh, were like contrary to the original conception I had of the channel and it required like stepping back and saying, okay, people keep asking for calculus. I guess I should cover it. Whereas there's this little nagging voice in the back of your mind, like, ah, oh, but there's a billion calculus things out there. Like, does there really need to be one more? And I think the answer is, um, as long as you have something to say, uh, and you can think of a place that it's additive, uh, it, you don't have to worry too much about like covering ground that's been covered before, because that's usually just a sign that people are seeking it out and there is value there and adding more to that discussion isn't necessarily, um, adding crowding to that space, but it might, uh, it might just like, uh, provide a perspective that someone wandering around that very crowded space didn't find where, wherever else they were looking. That happened um, to me. That was me. Oh, I'm glad. <laughs> just at all the formulas and then you also the beautiful visualization. It just clicked. <laughs> I'm glad. No, I, I'm really glad to hear that. Um, so yeah, just kind of staying focused on those principles. I, uh, but for the foreseeable future, just kind of focusing on videos as they have been. Um, I think there are certain aspects of the visuals that I want to like try to enrich um, a little bit. Like I, I did actually end up hiring someone to kind of help with some of the visuals this year uh, to just do the things that I'm not really, like rather than taking the things that I can do and trying to outsource that, taking the set of things that aren't even part of the existing videos so far that I don't really have the skill set for. and. Um, like outsourcing some of that. So, you know, you will see hopefully if that yeah, that be is exciting. added Looking forward to watching. Yeah. It'll be good. Yeah. So I've got, okay. So for perhaps a viewer, a young teenager, early uni student who's not that fond of mathematics, what would you say to them? Uh, I mean, I would ask more questions on what they think mathematics is, right? Um, I would want to know, you know, is it, uh, is it that it's challenging? You know, that you have something presented and it's just totally unclear what it's saying. Is it that it's boring? You know, why on earth would anyone care about factoring polynomials? Like that's just not connected to life. Um, I would have like a couple back pocket examples to try to illustrate like the simplest possible examples of what feels like true math, um, where you're just kind of discovering something or asking about a pattern, like, why is that true? Uh, you know, like one that I really like to turn to, it's simple, but I think that the kind of, when someone says, I really don't like math, it's not uncommon that they, this will like uh, be surprising in some way is that when you add up successive odd numbers, you get square numbers. Mm -hmm. So like one plus three is four, one plus three plus five is nine, one plus three plus five plus seven is 16 and um, on and on. And just asking the question, like, why is that case, the true? Like, wh why would it, odd numbers feel very different from square numbers? Why is it that adding um, the first couple odd numbers necessarily gives you a square uh you know there's many different ways that you can picture it there's enough different ways that someone might feel like they discovered their own picture of it you can confirm it algebraically but then knowing the picture than seeing the algebra sometimes lets you understand how every time that you see a bit of algebra more naked out in the wild there might be a nice picture behind it and there doesn't always have to be pictures to it but somehow knowing that there's um there's potentially a much more rich structure underlying what seems like a very banal set of symbols up on the blackboard like seeing a couple examples of that helps um, add a little bit of motivation. Uh, you know, the classic thing to think would to motivate people is give an application, something where you need it. So I, I know so many people who hated math, but came to it because of programming. Again, largely because I live in the Bay Area, I think I have a bias towards needing people who fit that archetype. But okay. the uh, that's harder to do like right in the moment. You know, you run into the high schooler who says they hate math. I'm like, well, first, <laughs> let me have you learn another really hard thing. <laughs> 
that will then like make you want to learn math. Um, but you know, if you have a little bit of a longer time with them, uh, if they're into games, say, let's try to make your own game. Let's take like a year to have that as a project. Uh, if they're into art, there's so much beautiful, so many beautiful things that you can make um, when you're adept with a computer and like able to program something a little bit so that merely as an art project, it's kind of neat to understand the algorithms that make something aesthetically appealing. Um, but honestly, you know, the, if, if it's that first little bit where it's because it's very confusing, you know, someone hates math because it's just never really clicked. Uh, that's probably more common and a lot harder, but you, I think with everyone, there's probably just a very small number of things that do need to click before everything else starts to fall into place. Um, you know, like if you're, if you're a young student and you're just starting to learn algebra, like this premise of taking facts that are true of numbers and you say like such and such will be true of all possible numbers that we plug in here and we just substitute it with symbols. Like that jump of being able to look at the symbols and like recognize, oh, in principle, I could substitute any number here. Oh, I'm like looking for the number that this symbol represents is one of those classic things where like, once you know it, it's, it's clear and you can like be comfortable manipulating it. But before you know it, it just feels like a set of rules for manipulating around without really checking why. And a good litmus test for this is um, like, there's some common um, mistakes algebraically that people will make with the rules that if you just plug in one or two numbers, you would confirm for yourself that it's um, not a problem. Like, uh, let's say you take, um, you know, two to the X divided by two to the Y, right? Mm -hmm. And you say like, simplify this. Um, and someone might just guess from the pattern matching of the symbols, like it's two to the X divided by Y. And you'd be like, oh, no, 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 it's actually two to the X minus Y. And they're like, where did that minus come from? We were just dividing things. And, you know, one way is to say like, well, that's just kind of the rule. That's why it is. You might even like prove it like symbolically. But the thing that'll make it click the most is just saying, let's just try a couple numbers. It's, it's two cubed divided by two squared. It's two to the fourth divided by two squared. Like what, what's the pattern here? Um, and, and so I, I suspect if someone didn't jump to that or they're making the little mistake before just blindly pattern matching, it means that there's like this missing gap at the very premise of algebra on, you can just plug numbers in um, that they like know on a rational level, but maybe on some like deeper level, it's, it's not there. I, I don't know what it is, but uh, I think in, in the scenario you painted, you'd really want to ask enough questions to build a thesis in your mind for like what, what those missing gaps are. Yeah, so guys, don't be scared to ask questions to your math teachers and everything. That's it, no, 100%. Um, so yeah, this that's, is like that's another of, one. This is kind Sorry. of a bit of a selfish question. So how would you like suggest someone to like study mathematics, like effectively so they understand? Okay. Uh, well, let's say I'm just talking to you. Like, what is your goal? Um, in studying mathematics? Is it that um, there's a particular field that you want to understand in the long run? Is yes, it so a general like sense? That... I kind of want to do engineering because that's very mathy. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, and like physics. I, okay. So in that case, um, you know, I think it's uh, as grounded as you can keep it in engineering. Like do just start doing engineering projects. And then whenever there's a math relevant question that comes up, uh, give yourself the freedom to like dive into it and you're probably going to end up with a deeper relationship for that particular question than the ones that come up in isolation in school um because you know I'll, as another example uh a lot of people who want to go into engineering one of the first classes you take in college is linear algebra um on the math side and so many people seem to have like a clicking moment when they finally understand let's just, like one uh, eigenvalues a particular topic and almost, almost always when I talk to people, that clicking moment doesn't happen in the actual linear algebra class. Like you take the class and then you learn this definition of a thing. You're like, okay, you do some exercises with it. You're like, okay, I guess. Um, and you might even have like a visual in your head for what it is, but it's very unclear, like why you would care, how would you, you would use it. But then you go on and you study like um, control theory and understanding like stability comes down to looking at a certain system and like finding eigenvalues and like, oh, okay, in this context. And it like grounds your knowledge or your, um, studying like in computer science graphs where you can like have certain states flow according to a, a rule where each node might have some weight assigning to some other node. And you want to say like, what, what are the stable conditions of this? Um, and uh, again, like eigenvalues end up popping up or if you study physics uh, in quantum mechanics, they have this certain role. And for a lot of people, it's the very specific case where it suddenly clicks and they're like, oh, this is like why you care. And this is why all these other like facts about this object are true. Um, and so I, I kind of have to wonder if there's some way that 
a student could have just started with that rather than getting this preemptory thing of the very um, general definition that could apply to all those different fields that they might go into because, hey, you've got a pile of different kinds of students in that one linear algebra lecture hall. Um, and instead, for each one of those students, somehow just as early as you can, like have them doing a project where that topic that's in the more general class um, has relevance. Uh, another thing I might say, um, aside from like choosing projects and um, letting yourself delve into the math that pops out of them, um, when you're choosing classes, uh, if you have flexibility at all, do so based on who's teaching it and whether you seem to resonate with like their teaching style more so than based on is it a topic that ahead of time you like thought you would really like? Because sometimes there will be a topic that you weren't really thinking about, but there's a great lecturer who's teaching it. Um, and they really engage with their students and they might speak to like your tastes and style in particular. You're probably going to have a better time in that class and you're probably going to learn a lot more than if you take one based on like a pre preconceived sense of like, oh, I, I really want to understand blank. And like, it's a mediocre person like teaching that. Um, and this is maybe, I mean, the American universities uh, kind of have a little bit more flexibility in like the early years, freshman, sophomore, where people often haven't declared a major in things. Um, and I know elsewhere, it can often be a little bit more rigid, exactly what you're taking by the time you don't do get in. Um, but you can take that same principle and still apply it at other levels. Like when you're in a particular class and you're learning from a book or maybe a set of books, uh, sometimes a book is not very well written or it doesn't really resonate with you and try to read topics based on when the author works well for you. And like, you can choose a different book. Like if you're taking a linear algebra class and you're reading from, I don't know, Axler, which is a great book, but it might not be for everyone who's just starting because it's very abstract. And you say, this isn't working for me. And then you pick up a different book and you paw through it and you get a sense, maybe it's string and that does work for you. Like just learn from that one, just read from that one. You don't have to like stick with the arbitrarily assigned thing in the class. That one fact, I really wish I had known at the start of college that you can kind of <laughs> like do your own shopping and choose your own book. And like, it might be a little bit less aligned with the class, but it's probably going to be better in the long run. Um, yeah, it's definitely there's many other things. YouTube as well. Just go on shopping, go, go watch different YouTubers. Different yeah. I will say that it's very hard to find the same depth that you get in a textbook on YouTube. So you, when, when that does happen, it's usually in the form of lectures that are posted online. Um, and this is clearly a little hypocritical, but like I, there, is a, there is a kind of shallowness to the content that I will make or that others will make in that it's just much less time, right? Like making a 20 minute video versus a class that cumulatively has like 20 hours. You just, you can't cover as much. So um, I even, hopefully this changes and it's like increasingly getting there with more and more content covered more and more deeply online. But it does seem like there's still this chasm in terms of what's available on YouTube versus what's available in the space of like published books. Yeah. But I really appreciate that piece of advice. Definitely going to take that up for sure. Before our last final talking point, I was wondering if you could please give our viewers like a piece of advice or anything you'd like on like careers on mathematics, on a like curiosity, one or many at your choice. Uh, so it's very broad. Um, yes. I don't know if anyone should be listening to career advice from me, right? Because uh, consider, like I'm very lucky uh, when I was, just doing the Khan Academy stuff that like Drew Blue and Brown was growing on the side and that I could make the choice to say, hey, there seems to be momentum in this thing. Let me try that instead of sticking to the original plan of um, like PhD professorship, all that. I think, you know, uh, th there's a quote I really like, which is no wind favors he who has no destined port, where you don't have to have like a super concrete plan about exactly what you want to do. But it's helpful to have some kind of destined port so that when there's serendipitous wins out there that pre present opportunities to you, you're able to like capitalize on them. So, you know, there's this balance, especially for a student who's just starting college for how strict you want to be with your sights on like what the long-term plan is, because the reality is when you're, you know, a, a late teenager, um, you just don't know much about the world, right? Your, your entire experience is like cent is centered around school and the, the vibe and habits of being in school. And you have to have something in there that gives you the opportunity to poke your head out and realize what other potential paths there are. So internships are great in that respect, um, where 
making sure that you're spending summers doing a non-academic thing, even if your long-term plan is uh, research, I actually think at least having one or two internships that are just doing something in industry that's more reflective of other kinds of jobs out there, at least gets you a sense of what other um, walks of life could be. Uh, don't go to grad school if you don't have a good reason for doing so. I think a lot of people do it by default because it's uh, you know, it feels very good to be able to say, someone says, what are your plans after college? You're like, oh, I'm going to grad school. They say, oh, good for you. M maybe it's good for you. Like maybe it is the case you want to be an apprentice to a researcher and um, nail that down, or there's a particular set of skills that you want to hone and it's only in the school context that you can do it. But in a lot of cases, I think people are doing it as a procrastinatory tactic and it would be better to just start doing the thing that you will end up doing in the long run. Um, you know, I think you want, at least personally, I really value in like a job, having a sense of ownership. Um, and obviously I like sort of made my own path. So I get that entirely. But even if it is in the context of being like in a company in another group, I think like there's really something satisfying about having um, a sense of pride around the thing that you're making or the thing that you with a team around you are, are, are making and maybe use as a litmus test. Like, do you have that sense of pride and that sense of ownership? Um, in what you're doing. And, and if you don't, maybe that's a sign that there's uh, like something else out there, but more than anything, don't take career advice from idiots like me. Like uh, I think really uh, let yourself uh, listen to just kind of what your own instincts are and then check those instincts against um, like find people who are doing something similar, interview them, you know, get, get to know them a little and, and like re, re, re refine what your instincts about that potential path are. Like a lot of people, you can have some, some thought for what it would be like to be a chemical engineer. And then you talk to a chemical engineer and you realize, actually, it's a little bit different than I thought. Or you say, oh, it's everything I dreamed of and more. Um, yeah, th th that might actually be one particular thing. Like be comfortable make, uh, scheduling informational interviews with people. Uh, like when you're a student, you, there's actually this great asset which you have, which is just how charming it is to others when you like reach out to them because people love to like act as a mentor in some way and like help bring up the next generation. And if you're, you know, a college student asking someone for career advice and you send out a cold email, that's like, hi, I'm like interested in the kind of things that you're doing. Do you happen to have like 15 minutes for me to just ask you a few questions about it? You know, people are probably, they're more likely to be generous with their time than if you're like 30 years old and you ask the same question because you're just like, who, who the heck are you? I, like, I don't have time for this. Um, so cherish that asset while you're young. No, thank you so much. That's really some good advice. And thank you so much, Grant, for appearing on the podcast. And thank you everyone for watching and listening. And I hope to see you all in our next podcast episode.